Welcome to our Rescues podcast, where we discuss the present, the past, and maybe the future of North Africa and the Sahel region. My name is Areski Daoud, and I am Principal Analyst at Mea Risk LLC, and I'm also the founder and editor of the North Africa Journal. Now join me every week for a new episode that addresses the root causes of instability in the region and beyond, and let's see if we can find solutions to complex crises. Welcome again. Welcome to our second week in review as we track critical issues in the Sahel and in North Africa. Today is the 30th of December, 2022, and therefore I want to wish all of you a happy new year. And so that, let's get to it. Now the Sahel region remained on our radar screen this week, uh, once again, as there has been no shortage of crises to track. This week in particular, problems focused on regional diplomatic relations, uh, specifically relations between Mali and its southern neighbor, Ivory Coast, uh, with relations souring over the jailing of 40, uh, 46 Ivorian soldiers in Mali. On uh, Friday the 30th of December, the trial in Mali of 46 Ivorian troops wrapped up ahead of a January 1st deadline imposed by the West African leaders, uh, Ivory Coast and other West African nations were hoping to see the soldiers released. Instead, uh, the court in Bamako sentenced them to 20 years in prison. How did this crisis begin? It started after the Ivory Coast and the United Nations brought these troops into Mali, uh, I think on July the 10th, to provide routine backup security to the German contingent uh, of the UN peacekeeping mission in Mali. But the Malian junta uh, called those troops mercenaries and wanted a public apology from Maori Coast. Bamako's purpose in detaining the Ivorian soldiers, partly anyway, was to pressure the government of uh, Ivory Coast to hand over people who had been on its territory since 2013, but who um, have been wanted in Mali. Ironically, a court in Ivory Coast on Wednesday prior to that handed down life terms to four Malian men convicted of providing support to attackers who stormed uh, and carried out uh, uh, a terror attack on, on a beach in Grand Bassam uh, outside Abidjan, killing 19 people. They actually essentially stormed a beach and killing 19 people just as it happened in Tunisia prior. Well, the attack took place on March 13, 2016. And Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, or Akim, claimed responsibility. Uh, this sentence in Abidjan is not likely related to the Ivorian soldiers detained in Mali, but anyway, it adds another layer of, uh, of interest. So where do we go from here uh, remains unclear to me. What is clear, though, is that Mali could now face further isolation with the West African leaders promising more sanctions if the troops are not released uh, promptly. Although the two countries share a border, in my opinion, it's not likely that they will resort uh, to some kind of military confrontation. But in such an environment, it, it would make sense, as far as I'm, I'm concerned, to assume that Russia would uh, look for a way to capitalize on this crisis and lend some support to the junta in Mali. Now, elsewhere in the region, uh, that is specifically in the Sahel, there have been clashes in southern Niger between Niger forces and Boko Haram fighters, uh, five of whom died um, uh, you know, at, at a clash between the towns of Bagay and Shungua in the Difa region, that's the southern province near Nigeria. Tensions there have been uh, high with Niger struggling to contain Boko Haram inf infiltrations uh, while attempting to contain a big humanitarian crisis with the presence of some 300,000 Nigerian refugees in the Difa region. In Burkina Faso, a call by a uh, UN coordinator uh, to withdraw non-essential UN personnel from Burkina Faso has angered the Burkina government, uh, which uh, ordered the official Italian diplomat, Barbara Menzi, uh, to leave the country. In any case, these various issues provide you with a glimpse 
uh, sort of on how the Sahel is ending the year 2022 and starting 2023, all in it is pretty disastrous in a disastrous fashion. Let me move to North Africa and let me start with Egypt, which is also closing 2022 with a, uh, with a tough time, essentially with a terror attack in the Ismailia on the Canal Suez, uh, resulting in the death of three uh, police officers. Now, the attack uh, happened on Friday, that's the December 30th, when assailants in two vehicles opened fire on the security checkpoint. One of the assailants was also killed uh, during the clash. Now, the previous such attack on security forces in Egypt happened uh, in May 2022, uh, earlier this year, when 11 soldiers, 11 soldiers were killed in uh, western Sinai. Days later, another clash also in the Sinai Peninsula claimed uh, the lives of five soldiers and seven insurgents. From my perspective, Egypt is in perpetual crisis mode. The situation there is not likely to improve as the military continues to harden its position while being in charge of all aspects of life in Egypt, though the military is in charge. Economically, though, the country is in big trouble, essentially uh, increasing um, its dependence on loans. Uh, the currency has been on a, on a free fall, which would likely have some serious negative effects on the livelihood of, the, of Egyptians in the many years to come. So. We do not rule out, I do not rule out, uh, social unrest in Egypt in the foreseeable future. The big story in Tunisia is still about the political crisis surrounding President Kais Sayed uh, and his tenure. Uh, last week, as you know, legislative elections ended with a turnout of less than 12%, giving the opposition ammunition to call for his resignation. Instead, President Sayed played down uh, the rather massive abstention and attacked the opposition, accusing them of wanting to bring the country back to dictatorship. He accused his foes of, and I'm quoting here, drowning in corruption and treachery, end of quote, and then uh, again plotting against the state and its internal and external security, as quoted by AFP. On an equally serious note, prosecutors probably close to the president ask the country's judicial watchdog there in Tunisia to strip 13 judges uh, of immunity so they can be tried on terror charges, no less. President Sayed um, has been on the offensive against the judiciary after he dismissed 57 judges earlier this year, accusing them of, once again, corruption and meddling in political affairs. Let me move slightly east, and that is to Libya, where rivalry between east and west is such that the two are clearly treating each other as foreign enemies, so much so that the so-called unity government in, uh, in Tripoli has carried out a prisoner swap with rival eastern forces, releasing a pilot uh, captured during uh, Strongman Khalifa Haftar's 2019 assault on Tripoli. The move, or this move, reminds me of those prisoner swaps where, that you hear uh, sort of about Russia and the United States. Classic enemies, not among people of the same nation, and so Libya is such a, a tribal environment. Uh, meanwhile, the 35-year-old Lockerbie bombing case has once again interjected itself into Libyan politics. Uh, this week, Prime Minister Abdelhamid Baybeh approved uh, the handover to the United States uh, of a suspect um, involved, uh, allegedly involved in the 1988 Lockerbie attack, uh, which, as you know, resulted in the killing of 270 people when their Pan Am jet exploded over Scotland. Baiba may be seeking the support of the Americans, but he is facing big public backlash at home for, uh, for the handover. So what else is happening in the region uh, that uh, may be newsworthy? Well, uh, we note the arrest by the Algerian police, more specifically the political police of independent uh, journalist Al Qadi Hassan, and uh, their forced closure of the premises of uh, the online news media that uh, that he manages, uh, uh, Maghreb Emergent and its web uh, radio station Radio M. Uh, the two were the last independent media outlets still op operating in Algeria. The reasons for the arrests of Hassan and uh, the search carried out by the security services are probably related to allegations 
that he received money from foreign sources with the purpose of undermining national security, blah, 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 blah. Charges that are completely bonus, bogus, pardon me. Uh, the arrest comes the day after the broadcast uh, of two programs and the publication of an article relating to the likelihood of a second mandate or a second term for not mandate, but a term really for President Taboon because he has no mandate. And the anti-regime movement known as the Herak movement. Hassan also released tweets questioning the, the incredible declaration of Taboon, which advanced a figure of $20 billion recovered following embezzlements by the oligarchs. Uh, the sealing of the premises of uh, Radio M and uh, Maghreb Emergent and the rest of its director uh, are clearly in violation of Algerian, Algeria's own laws highlighting the ongoing and sustainable, or sustained, pardon me, sustained campaign of intimidation and harassment targeting the independent media in Algeria. So at this stage, we, we are caught up with the big stories uh, in North Africa and the Sahel as we come to a, a close for 2022 and the beginning of 2023. And with that, I would like to wish all of you again a happy new year and to a prosperous, healthy, and a fun 2023. Thank you. Thank you for listening. To subscribe to our podcast series, please visit mea-risk.com slash audio. That is mea-risk.com slash audio to find out more. If you are interested in a six-month trial for our critical incident awareness, and notification system, please visit shield-alert.com. That is shield-alert.com. Until our next podcast, thank you and goodbye.